<laughs> on the interim, I uh, hope that we can uh, still reach you. So we're going to step on into the woods and go ahead and get started until the sound system catches up with us. Our first stop is just inside the woods a little bit to uh, get off of the asphalt and um, and away from the chimes. <laughs> Welcome to our Gordon Flank Attack program. Uh, one of the first questions that I was asked is something you are probably all considering or wondering is are we in National Park Service property and why did we gather at a church if we are? The last time that I ever had a large group out here of equivalent to this size or close to it was for a Friday evening History at Sunset program. Yeah. At my, my assistant was Jake Struhelka who's in the rear of the audience right now. When, and um, when we thought of doing that, we said the only way we think we can do it to park the people is to park on Hill You'll Drive and walk across Route 20. <laughs> Great idea. <laughs> and we talked to the rangers and said, why do you think about stopping traffic on Route 20? And the time that we asked, the person we asked said, oh, I think we can do that. <laughs> then we did the program. <laughs> And I think maybe the only five people in the entire state that think that blue lights mean accelerate um, were uh, traveling on Route 20 at that time. And when it was done, our ranger said, we are never, ever doing that again. And part of the reason that's a very appropriate question for tonight is the only reason we are able to do this program is out of the generosity of the Lake of the Woods Church, the Lake of the Woods uh, subdivision and their security folks and also the Lake of the Woods study group that did all the legwork for us to arrange this. So you did obviously drive in and park on... So you obviously parked on private property but almost as soon as we stepped off of the parking lot we are in the park and there is a trail system here that begins from the Wilderness Exhibit Shelter if you ever want to take this on your own. Okay. Now, um, don't have to give too many warnings for this trail. It's a pretty good trail. There are going to be times when because of the size of our group, you may need to step off of the trail as many of you have already done. So just please do watch your step. And yet, I don't know if ticks are out yet, but just so you know, if you're not residents of the area, ticks are these little bitty insects about the size of a head of a pin, or some of them maybe five times that size, and they can carry Lyme disease. Uh, so if you do get bit with a tick, um, especially if it's on your body for like two days or so before you discover it, uh, the advice is to save the tick, put it in double baggie, put it in the freezer, and if you do develop some of the symptoms. One of the easier ways to determine if you have the disease. Um, but other than that, we'll delve into our program and I think one of the most fascinating things about the story that we'll be sharing tonight is the way in which two particular individuals interact and in their relationship. John B. Gordon is a man who is a brigade commander in this battle and uh, brigade, his, I know I looked at the stats for this and what I found is that the two brigades that are going to be a part of this are said to be about 3,500 men. So it's not quite 2,000 men averaging in a brigade, but that's the size that he has. And his superior, who is a man uh, named Jubal Anderson Early, who would command probably somewhere in the neighborhood of seven, 8,000 men. And uh, I like to tell you just a little bit about both of them so you get a little bit of a feel for what they're like and see that in many ways these guys are, are opposites. A former staff officer of John B. Gordon would say this about him, said the men felt that the general was not merely a superior officer, but a friend and any degree a kinsman. And he went on to tell this little story as an example. He said, once a Georgia youth, gawky and shamefaced, came to the general's tent and asked to see him privately. <coughs> the private had trouble and a lover's quarrel to smooth with an absent sweetheart in Georgia. 
And what Gordon did was write a letter for him to smooth things over. <laughs> uh, and as we shall see, that is not something you would expect Jubal Early to do. Uh, a couple of other things about, uh, about John B. Gordon. Uh, Stephen D. Lee tells about John Gordon at the Battle of Antietam, saying he had the God-given talent of getting in front of his troops and being able to lead them into the jaws of death. So we see in one story a very kind-hearted man that cares about his soldiers. On the other side we see this very brave lion-like man out on the battlefield. And um, another account of Gordon, this one attributed to him at Gettysburg, said standing in his stirrups, bareheaded, hat in hand, arms extended, and in a voice like a trumpet exhorting his men, it was superb, absolutely thrilling. So he can also inspire his, his troops as well. So in a, in a nutshell, in Gordon, I see somebody who's very affable, he is charismatic, he's motivational, and he is non-military trained. This is a man who uh, is a lawyer, and spent much of his time before the war running a family mining business in northwest Georgia, northeast Alabama, and the point where it meets with Tennessee. So it's a little bit of a character of John B. Gordon, our division commander, that we'll be dealing with tonight. Now for a little bit about Jubal Anderson Early. First, his nickname that Robert E. Lee has given to him. His bad old man. <laughs> Taking a look at Jubal Early in his younger days, when he was at West Point. Um, Rit, um, God, Armistead, what the heck is his first name? Lewis. Lewis. Lewis Armistead would be, and I didn't check up to see whether he was suspended or expelled from West Point, but one of the reasons why he left West Point when he did was because he had hit Jubal Early over the head with a plate. <laughs> and after knowing a little bit more about Jubal Early, um, I think there is very little doubt that he was probably provoked into this by Early. Early ha was very biting in his humor, and I think you would probably say he's sarcastic. Among the people that he would be most sarcastic with were men that were in love, are people that were greatly religious. There is a time, for example, when during the heat of battle, he saw a chaplain heading toward the rear and had to accost him about why, if he was so anxious to get to heaven, was he uh, leaving from a spot in which he had a very good chance of making it there. <laughs> um, so, uh, that is, gives you a little bit of feeling of what uh, he was, oh, one other thing I, I was going to add. He also has, as you might imagine, going along with this, a very foul mouth. I remember there was a uh, program given by um, Gary Gallagher, who uh, has done a lot of studying with Jubal Early, and he opened up a program on him by uh, saying at one uh, time in his camp, a staff officer heard him cursing and he wrote down, you know, exactly what the, all the swearing was about. And the staff officer went up to, to Early and says, General, what's the matter? Thinking there must be something absolutely horrible for him to be uh, spitting out oaths like this. And uh, what had happened is that he popped a button off of his uh, uniform jacket. Uh, that was the reason for all of his oaths. So it gives you an idea of just, just what he is like. In the first battle in which John B. Gordon served under Jubal Anderson early as a division commander. So again, Jubal Earl A. as division commander, Gordon one of the brigade commanders, was during the Chancellorsville campaign, and they were engaged in the Second Battle of Fredericksburg, as later on I'll share with you, uh, he's making reference to the Battle of Marie's Heights. And in their very first action, they, they came into conflict right away. Uh, an order was issued to Gordon, which was, he was apparently supposed to make some kind of an adjustment in his line, and he misunderstood and thought that he was supposed to go forward. And according to Gordon, uh, Early came up to him and said, you better be successful in this attack, otherwise I'm going to prefer charges against you, because he was not supposed to be attacking at the moment. 
the two would often find themselves at uh, other sides of arguments and discussions, and that would continue even after the war, particularly when they put down their swords and picked up their pens. Um, so, uh, very interesting to look at the things that they would write about each other. And as we'll see at our next stop, this battle is no exception for these two men. Now, a little background before we uh, pick up what happened here tonight. For John B. Gordon, his first experience in this battle of the wilderness was on the first day of action south of the Orange Turnpike. Uh, different historians uh, argue about exactly where he was. I place him in the Higgerson field. Some have him further north in Saunders field. Uh, he had a, a very important role in helping to stabilize the Confederate line at a time when it was in, uh, in some danger in the opening phase of the action, uh, the fight across Saunders Field and Higgerson Field. But then later in the day, he is shifted up all the way up into our vicinity, placed on the extreme left flank of the Confederate Army. Um, on the day of May 6th, the day 150 years ago today, there is actually quite a bit of fighting in these woods. We generally don't hear a whole lot about it. They were generally small scale and didn't have much of an impact on the battle per se. But the fighting got started at about 4.30 in the morning. As you may know, the Union plan was to attack at 5 o'clock in the morning. Our Union forces in this area of the 6th Corps under John Sedgwick, and Sedgwick showing a little bit of his humor when the Union Army is preparing to attack at 5 and the Union and the Confederates start attacking him at 4.30, he makes a comment that uh, the Confederates' uh, watches are, must not be set properly. Um, so, fighting gets started a little bit at uh, 4.30 or so in the morning, and when it eventually dies down some, John B. Gordon, being here at the end of the line, decided to do what any pro a prudent person would do, protecting the flank of the Army, and that is trying to see what he can find out about the troops around him. Um, when you're the flank of the army, you want to make sure that area is protected because it is so vulnerable. Um, and um, as he goes out and does his scouting, first of all, he sends out some scouts to try to report back to him. And they kind of astonishingly report back, even though that the Union Army had 118,000 men is twice the size of the Confederate Army that the Confederate line, the scouts say, extend further north than the Union line. The Confederate line, incidentally, would be back in this direction or behind me for those that have trouble seeing kind of where I am. The Union lines are off in that direction. So those of you that are looking this way are looking the same way that Union forces would be even though they're behind you. And again, I'm looking the way Confederates would, even though their line is behind me, line of earthworks. But up in this direction, the Confederate line extends further to the north than the Union line does. Well, he thinks this is almost too good to be true, because there's an opportunity for the Confederates to hit the Union flank, if it is. So Gordon himself will eventually go out, do some reconnaissance, and uh, we'll find out that it is true that the Union flank is further south than his own. He decides to look behind it to see if there are any reserves. If it's a line with a lot of lines to it, a lot of troops stacked up behind the end of that flank, it might not be such a great opportunity, but he goes back there and finds that there are no reinforcements. Now, earlier in the day, even before Gordon went out on his reconnaissance, whenever that was, but fairly early in the morning. But Ambrose Burnside and his 9th Corps of the Union Army had been right near the entrance of this subdivision where you came in. I'm not sure if you noticed when you uh, came in, but there was a little park off to your left a short distance. There are actually some historical markers and some ruins there for the, the Spotswood House, a landmark that shows up on some of the maps. But right there in that area is where Burnside had bivouacked. He had already taken off to head to the battlefield, and at 7.30 that morning he stopped for breakfast while all the fighting is going on in the Widow Tap field that he's supposed to be a part of. But he is gone from that area by the time Gordon makes his reconnaissance. Now the other thing he wanted to look for, so he found that the flank is indeed 
shorter than his own. He found there's no reserves behind it. The next thing he wanted to see is in this wilderness, is there a place where he can position his troops to prepare for an attack? And he found a field, um, we think it's what is called the Roach Field. Uh, apparently a family by the name of Roach lived somewhere in this area. And now that he found a significant place where he could line up troops, his next task is to try to share that information with his superiors and convince them that there is a grand opportunity in front of them. And, again, perhaps the most interesting aspect of this whole story is not how the fighting un, 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 unfolded, but how the decision was made on what the Confederates should do given this information. And that is what Frank is going to delve into as we go take a look at some of the earthworks on the Confederate line and touch upon and sp well, spend a fair amount of time looking at the various accounts and versions of what happened, of who said what, in this particular decision. All right? Now, where is Frank? All right, great. Okay, we are heading in this direction next. High volume. So General Gordon has to sell a plan to a hairy malignant spider. And as he explains it, they have the chance, because the Confederate line that you have right in front of you extends beyond the Federal line out behind you. Over the course of May 5th into May 6th, this area has been fought over many times. The reason I brought you here is a conundrum. The trenches in front of us, if I could have you step out of them, <laughs> are facing that way. They are facing in the direction you are facing. It has traverses in it for protection from side fire. There you go. Now, now I get to compete with it. <laughs> okay. So, at one time, the Union Six Corps did occupy this place. And they were driven back, probably on May 5th. And when the Confederates Assume this spot, they took this Union line and refaced it to their advantage. So we are looking at a piece of ground that was occupied by both sides at one point or another. And the physical evidence is right here. Uh-oh. We're in trouble. Uh-oh. Get out of the trench. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hey. 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 All right, modern technology at its finest. Thanks, guys. Brilliant. Heroes. Heroes. Hey. Hey. These guys uh, did a gallant effort to get us the sound system out here and to save your hearing from me being too loud. So, uh, we owe them all a great gratitude. So. <laughs> Is that a challenge, Greg? <laughs> No up here on the high side. All right. Incidentally, could you guys hear me before? Yes. Yes. That's heartening to know. Is that better, Greg? All right. Can you hear me now? We're doing good? Yes. All right. Now, selling the plan. The idea is that the Confederate line occupied here now extends beyond the Union forces. Here is a chance to take a leap and go out beyond the end of the Union line, turn and crush the end of it. They're going to propose at this point to take two Confederate brigades, including Gordon Zoom, and put them out on the end of the Union line. It's like a large capital T, we're going to cross the T. But that's not the entire plan, because two brigades is small. And we are looking for something vastly bigger. So the plan is, according to Gordon, that as the two brigades strike the Union line, route them out of their line, and the Union troops start to retreat back towards Saunders Field, back towards the south, up along their trenches, 
they will be unmasking more and more of the <coughs> alternative Confederate line opposite them. That unleashes the Confederates there to jump into the attack and add weight to the overall. As it was explained, as each of Sedgwick's brigades gave way in confusion, the corresponding Confederate brigade, whose front was thus cleared of the general line, was to swing into column of attack on the flank. Good attack? Good idea? All right, let me ask you. When we started this attack, we had two brigades that are our front runners crossing the T. As the attack proceeds up the hill and goes down the Union line, I should say, how wide is the front? How big is the attack? It's still two brigades, folks, because everybody else swings in behind it. So it's still the two front runners that are going to be the two front runners. If the Confederates along this line jump in prematurely and try to unhinge those Federal troops opposite them, if they succeed, that means they're in front of the two front runners and an obstacle to the two front runners. So if they get behind you, they don't participate. If they get in front of you, they make sure you don't participate. So this is a very tricky venture, but Gordon thinks that it can work under the circumstances of the wilderness. So he is going to go and sell this idea. He's going to send a staff officer, a man named T.G. Jones, off to General Headquarters to feed this to the Confederate Second Corps Commander, Richard Stoddart Ewell. T.G. Jones didn't find Ewell at Headquarters, but he did find the Division Commander, Jubal Early. And according to T.G. Jones, that Early condemned the plan addressing Gordon's staff officer, quote, rather sharply. <laughs> so he was not at all impressed with this pitch for an attack, even though Gordon himself assured that, quote, the greatest opportunity ever presented to Lee's army was right there in front of them. And that's pretty disarming hyperbole. The greatest? Just a year ago in these woods, we had Stonewall Jackson's flank attack. But Gordon thinks that he can do something on a smaller scale and build it to a much larger scale. General Early had three serious objections to this. Number one, he thought that Gordon's assault was too small. In fact, we talked about two brigades still being two brigades. Perhaps there's a great merit to that thought. The second thought was, that a repulse at this particular time of the Confederate forces in this particular sector might be disastrous. Because not only do we have the Union right flank looming through these woods, we have a very tenuous, thin, and you're looking at the entire defense of the Confederates in this sector, one line that stretches off and you're looking at the Confederate left. So if this fails, everything in front of you becomes unhinged. And then the third objection was that while Gordon thought there were no reserves anywhere near the Union right flank, Early himself thought there were considerable reserves in this area. And he may have had some merit to that. You heard that when Gordon went on his reconnaissance, that he was able to see the flank, he was able to extend deep into their rear and find no reserves. So they were isolated and alone. But you really doesn't do a reconnaissance in this direction, straight behind you. Jubal really does a reconnaissance in that direction, to the north, and goes as far as the Culpeper Road, or the Germana Plank Road. And there, he did see the Ninth Corps. Those folks were breaking camp at one or two in the morning. They were supposed to get down to the Wilderness Tavern and get into the fight down on the southern end of the battlefield. And remember, that attack was supposed to start at 5 a.m. And as you heard from Greg, Ambrose Burnside likened to being a rather pleasant, plump abbot was being pleasant and plump while having breakfast. His troops don't get on the road past Wilderness Tavern until after 7.30 in the morning. So if his vanguard is getting down there at 5 and his tail is not getting through the, there until after 7.30, that means that at 7.30, or prior to 7.30, the road up north of us was filled with Union troops. So in the small circle of schemes 
the Union flank is open and there are no reserves. But in the bigger circle of things, there is almost an entire Union Army Corps sitting above us. And that's the objection. So, sales pitch number one fails. And they are dressed rather sharply. Gordon wasn't about to give up. Eight o'clock in the morning, he leaves here and goes to General Ewell's headquarters to pitch it in person. There, he is going to find Jubal Early, his nemesis, and his corps commander. He's going to go ahead and make a tremendous pitch for the opportunity here, and at the very same time, Jubal Early is going to make a pitch that this would be a disastrous consequence. Jubal Early's answer was that not only a repulse at this time would be disastrous to the left wing of the Confederate Army, it would be disastrous to Lee's entire army. Now, this is 7 o'clock in the morning. This is two hours after the Widow Tap venture happened just on the southern end of this field. So disaster is a reality that was visited already this day before we had this conversation. According to one of the staff officers who works for Richard Ewell, his uh, uh, son-in-law by marriage, Campbell Brown, he said that Richard Ewell actually agreed with Gordon but was talked out of it by Jubal Early in his earnestness. So as much as he wanted to agree with Gordon, he backed down from Early. As they continued to talk and argue rather vehemently, Richard Ewell decided the only way he could arbitrate between Gordon, the brigade commander, and Early, the division commander, was to do his own reconnaissance. And so we're going to have yet a third set of eyes go out here and take a look at these woods. Unfortunately for Gordon, Richard Yule can't do it right away. He has other obligations before he is able to come down here. And that's going to prevent him from getting down here until the afternoon. When Gordon left this meeting, he was deeply, deeply hurt, frustrated, and angry. According to him, he confided to one of his staff officers, General Early evidently believed, didn't believe a word of what I told him of what I had seen myself. And so he had to go back to his own headquarters and wait. Ironically, Gordon was soon confronted by the wisdom of Early's prediction. Because no sooner does he get back to where we are than a small group of Confederate cavalry above us, the 1st North Carolina Cavalry, is going to report that this position is being flanked in turn by Federals. That message was handed to Gordon, who was commanding the flank. He dutifully sent it back up the chain of command, but the ever dogmatic and decisive Gordon had to add a little coda to the bottom of this report. He wrote, this must be a fate, and I still think it best to make the move I spoke of, and it will check any move to our left, and if made, I should like the order at once. I could feel for them very soon. And then, if necessary, look after this flanking party. So his answer to being flanked is to flank the Federals, isolate the flanking Union troops, and force them to either withdraw or be surrounded. So, in fact, we just made pitch number three that we should do a flank attack. And it didn't even get an endorsement from Early. He had already made up his mind. It wasn't going any further. At about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, we're going to add another Confederate brigade to strengthen the defense, not the offense. And that's a brigade of North Carolinians led by a brigadier named Robert D. Johnston. As Johnston's men file onto the field at 1 o'clock, they're among the latest of the late comers for the Confederate Army here. They have been, just as recently as yesterday, 150 years ago, down in Taylorsville, which is just 20 miles outside of Richmond. They pulled an all-nighter. They showed up on this field on May 6th, dog tired and exhausted. And the first thing they do is shuttle them off the roads and into this remote corner of wilderness to extend the flank and guard. 
Gordon looks at the newcomer as yet another opportunity to pitch his agenda. So he is going to, at 1 o'clock, again, appeal that now we've reinforced this, we have even more strength out here, and our line extends even further beyond the federal line. Here is our chance to make it happen. Now, that doesn't go anywhere for the moment, because everything hinges on Richard Stoddard, Stoddard Ewell. General Ewell will eventually be able to take care of all his other business and hurry down here and take a look for his cell. By the time he comes out here and visits this site, the Union flank is still dangling, and the Union Ninth Corps is nowhere to be found. So that has disappeared. In the course of this, even Jubal Early is going to change his mind because he was afraid of Union Reserves. There are no Union Reserves. He was afraid that Gordon was too small, but now it's late in the afternoon. As darkness starts to descend upon us, if Gordon strikes and the Union Army is given a chance to regroup and strike back, that would be a difficulty. But it's now so late in the day that you really doesn't believe that the Union Army can reorganize and counterattack. So we've negated that. Here is a chance to actually consider a flank attack. Something that we propose first thing in the morning is now starting to become a reality in the late, late afternoon. According to Richard Ewell, he is the one who decided they should make this attack. <laughs> According to Jubal Early, he is the one who decided they should make an attack here. According to John Brown Gordon, Robert E. Lee is the one who decided they should make an attack. According to Gordon, who gives us a delightfully fanciful story, that Robert E. Lee had left the southern end of the field and ventured up here for a conference at 5.30 in the evening to talk to Richard Yule and try to gain leverage on this end of the battlefield to break the pressure and stalemate on the southern end of the battlefield. They were preparing to make a massive, grand assault on the southern end of the field to capture the Brock Road. They wanted something of equal substance and significance on the north side of the battlefield. Allegedly, when Robert E. Lee asked for suggestions, Jubal Early and Richard Ewell got in his way, just as they had gotten in Gordon's way. According to Gordon's version, Richard Ewell was reticent, uncertain, unsure, deferring to General Early. Early was adamant that they were lucky to hold on to what they had. They should not provoke a sleeping giant in front of them. And at that point, Robert E. Lee was deeply disappointed, to which John Brown Gordon said, General Lee, I have a plan. <laughs> to which the great chieftain listened to Gordon and thought it was a remarkable plan. And that's when it gets this endorsement. One thing we should know about John Brown Gordon, he writes, and he writes prolifically. He writes considerably after the Civil War, but he always believed that the moral of his story <coughs> transcended the accuracy of his story. <laughs> so one of the things that we should think about is if this meeting even happened. According to one of Jubal Early's staff officers, a major non named John Warwick Daniel, it never happened, and that this was pure fiction, according to him. And for three reasons that Warwick Daniel cited. Number one, it was uncharacteristic of Robert E. Lee. He would never take the word of a brigade commander over that of a division and a corps commander. That was unseemly in the chain of command. That is not the kind of behavior that a commanding officer of Lee's stature would encourage. So that wouldn't be true. Secondly, Robert E. Lee wasn't here. Because Robert E. Lee at 5.30 is launching that major attack on the southern end of the battlefield. And he wasn't about to walk away from the biggest attack he has put together yet on the wilderness battlefield to come stand up here and talk about what might be as opposed to what is. 
And number three, as John Warwick Daniel points out, that in 1868, when General Gordon wrote about this entire episode, he never mentioned Robert E. Lee. He never even remembered Robert E. Lee being on this end of the battlefield. But in 1903, he not only remembered Lee, he remembered all the details and the dialogue that went with it. So 35 years cleared his memory somehow. In truth, Robert E. Lee will visit this end of the battlefield, but he will not visit this end of the battlefield until May 7th, tomorrow. On May 6th, he was on the southern end of the field. Now, does that mean that Robert E. Lee didn't weigh in on this? Not necessarily. Because remember, Richard Yule couldn't do a reconnaissance because he had pressing business. What is the pressing business? The pressing business was that he was summoned to the southern end of the field to talk to Robert E. Lee. General Gordon wasn't privy to this. Jim Orley wasn't privy to this. General Stoddard Yule is going to be the one who's going to be there. And as they talked about possibilities for the north end of the field, a flank attack very well may have been mentioned. A flank attack very well may have been encouraged. But Robert E. Lee was not going to make it a necessity because he had not seen the ground and was not familiar with this, the setting, the context. So it really boils down to the Confederate Second Corps. Richard Ewell is going to do a reconnaissance. Jubal Early is going to realize that all his caveats have been met. And so we have gotten to the point where the sun is starting to create deep and long shadows in the wilderness. And at this point, they give the go-ahead. It doesn't matter whose idea it was. It doesn't matter who's going to give the approval and who didn't. Because regardless of who desired to take the credit for what happened at this particular moment in the wilderness, in these conditions that we're looking at, two brigades of Confederates left these trenches and crept stealthily off to the north to get well beyond the Union lines and do it while they're not being detected. Gordon, regardless of everything he has transpired here during the day, is finally going to get his way and get his chance to make his mark. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Greg, who's going to show us the payoff for all of this effort and fighting just to get the plan approved. Greg. All right. <laughs> moving. Moving. Fort preservation message, which I normally been doing, and of course I forgot for this one, but we are now upon the uh, Union Earthworks, and please, no matter where you happen to be, whether it's in a national park where it's a regulation not to stand on earthworks or any place, whenever we stand on earthworks, what we help to do is compact the soil, and when we do that, that means that the plants that are growing on the earthworks, their roots cannot penetrate into that hard, compacted soil. And since those roots are not holding the soil together when it rains, then that earth will start to wash away. So the best way to make sure that earthworks are preserved for future generations to be able to see is to look at them from a distance and not get close enough that you may possibly stand on them. But part of the Union Earthwork line is directly behind me. Okay. Um, and for those that are standing here, you can see that a uh, little bit behind me and to the right, the earthwork comes to an end and it bends back a little bit. The Union soldiers, again, would be here facing the same direction that I am. We also happen to know from a troop, um, a map that was done by an engineer named Mickler shortly after the war who mapped earthworks, that the earthwork line, even though you see it ending here, it did extend over to that next hill. You'll notice that immediately to my right, there is a small stream that's readily visible. 
It even got a little water standing in it, and I guess with our recent rain, it washed away some of the leaves that might have been in it. That stream shows up in the map, and clearly that next hill over there is where the Union right end of the line was resting. Even though the map shows some earthworks, interesting, many of the accounts of the Federals indicate they didn't have any, so it gives me the impression that whatever they, they must have built that was visible when the engineer came to map, it must have been very, very slight. So again, keep in mind Union flank on that particular hill. That's the very end of the Union position. And then as Frank mentioned, John B. Gordon got permission to take his brigade and a brigade of North Carolinians commanded by Robert D. Johnston to make, boy, to make a maneuver off in that direction, the direction in which you see the sun setting, to line up facing the same way that the sun rays are shining toward us, getting prepared for the moment when they would launch their attack. While they are getting prepared, there are some Union soldiers up on the knoll that will decide, uh, they, they, they are skirmishers for the Union Army, they are trying to make sure that their position doesn't get surprised, and they happen to see a Confederate vedette, mounted man, and they decide to go after him, see if they can capture him. The mounted man gets away, but in their pursuit of him, they say they stumble upon a large number of Confederates waiting out there getting ready to attack. They come back and start to spread the word, but it is not spread in time. Now for the Union soldiers that are over here, I'd like to put you a little bit, uh, now that we, we know what's about to happen, let's look at the different brigades that are here and uh, see in a moment why that may be important. Alexander Shaler's troops are situated on that particular knoll. Um, Alexander Shaler is commanding some troops that have a nickname of Milroy's Weary Boys. <laughs> Robert Milroy had commanded some of these troops and uh, they have a reputation for not being excellent soldiers. This is uh, really only their second battle that they're going to be in with the Army of the Potomac. The first battle was in the Mine Run Campaign in November of the previous year. They happen to be assigned to a division commanded by Horatio Wright, and I'll visit that again in a moment, and you'll see why that's significant. The next troops on down were commanded by Truman Seymour, and he's from a division commanded by a man named Ricketts. And then further on up the slope as we go walking will be Neal's brigade from Getty's division. For those of you that have been around with us for a while, yesterday we uh, had a program in which we looked at Getty's division fighting on the Orange Plank Road and belonging to that division was the Vermont Brigade. Now, why, does that strike anybody unusual that this division right here up the slope belongs to Getty's division that includes the Vermont Brigade on the other end of the battlefield? Pardon me? Yeah, they're, they're very, very far apart. This division has been broken up. And in fact, if you notice, I talked about the three brigades in a row that are from three distinctly different divisions. Again, the one brigade over there is in right. The one kind of over here is Ricketts. And the one further on up the hill is from Getty. Is that a nice situation? What's kind of the problem with three different brigades from different divisions? The chain of command. And there is nobody with ultimate responsibility for taking a look at this sector as a whole. And it's a very important sector being on the end of the line, a flank, the most vulnerable part, arguably, of an army. Now... One of the reasons for some of the split was the need for to get Getty's main part of his division down on the Orange Plank Road to try to intercept the intersection of the Orange Plank Road with the Brock Road. That way they could make sure that the entire Union Army had a chance to unite. To remember, further south from that intersection was Winfield Scott Hancock's one quarter of the Union Army while the rest of the three quarter were kind of up in our area. So it was a very good reason. There's a logical reason to send part of them away rather quickly. And so why we have one isolated brigade sitting here. 
the other reason for the brigade on the hill where I said there are either no earthworks or very scant earthworks is because of an understanding that they might need to strengthen this end of the line so they pulled a brigade from a, another division to swing it down here. That brigade on that hill commanded by Shaler arrived at just 2 o'clock in the afternoon, only a few hours before this attack. Part of the reason why they either don't have earthworks or scant earthworks because they didn't have much time to repair a position. Now the Union High Command apparently did appreciate that this was a little awkward and that they assigned uh, Truman Seymour out here to keep an eye on both of these uh, brigades here at the end of the line. Um, but again, there's no body of real high authority, no true division commander keeping an eye on this. Schaller, however, was not very pleased with his position, and he went back to see the Corps Commander, John Sedgwick, uh, complaining about the situation out here and asking if there could be some help that was given. Um, and at the moment this action began, um, both of these generals down here at this end, Schaller and Seymour, are at the headquarters in which uh, they are proclaiming that their, their command has repulsed a couple of, of what they described as attacks that afternoon. Again, there are a lot of probes going on throughout this day and giving the opinion that they don't think that their command can withhold one more attack. And as we'll see, they were absolutely right. So, so, with that, back to the Confederate side. Now that we've taken a little bit of a look at the Union soldiers that are here. John B. Gordon, being a lawyer and uh, liking to give speeches, feeling that, uh, as we talked about before, he liked to be inspirational and motivational to his men. He often, right before they went into battle, gave them a talk. And they realized through some of their scouting that this was the Union Six Corps out here that it happened to be their opponent in the Second Battle of Fredericksburg during the Chancellorsville campaign, almost exactly one year earlier. A sergeant by the name of Francis Hudgens recalls what the speech was on this morning, or on this afternoon, and Gordon got up to them, apparently addressing in the thickets of the wilderness, perhaps addressing each regiment on down the line, but when he got in front of this 38th Georgia, he said, 38th, this is 6th Corps we're going to attack, the same fellows we fought on Marie's Heights. Those that we didn't get then, we want now. So with that motivational speech, Gordon's men and Johnston's will kick off their attack. Now, the... Gee, I think I need to stand back and kind of make sure I'm behind this tree. Um, all right. One of the regiments that was on the hillside opposite us was the 122nd Ohio in the Federal Army, and I'd like to share with you a count of um, what he had to say. And by our troop movement maps, we have them literally right on the other side of that ravine. So as you look up that hill, you are literally looking, to the best of our knowledge, at the position of the 122nd Ohio. They said that they had six regiments in the front, and they claim they had some men in entrenchments in the front, four men, four companies right behind them in reserve. He said, at sunset, a feint was made upon our front and a vigorous assault on our right flank. The regiments on my right gave way one after another. When the regiment was ordered to retreat, there was not a man in the entrenchments on my right or left. So quick were the movements of the enemy that when I first discovered them in our rear, they were in rear of the center of my regiment, scattering the second line with all speed. The accounts of the Confederates tend to agree that everything went very, very quickly, that the Federals here did not stick around very long. George Washington Nichols said we could not give them but two volleys. How long does it take for a Civil War soldier to fire twice? Basically about a minute or maybe even less than a minute. They loaded their guns before they kicked off. They got two volleys off. Maybe that's even 30 seconds. He said it seemed like scaring up a bunch of partridges or crows. 
they left stampeded and panic-stricken. And one of the Confederate units to attack, the same man we mentioned before that told us about Gordon's speech, he describes his unit hitting squarely at the end of the line, going right up immediately behind the Union earthworks. He said, my company struck the Federal breastworks squarely on the end. I advanced up in rear of their works at least a mile, and at each step their confused mass became more dense. What do you think a lot of soldiers are doing at uh, this particular time of night? What, you, what might you be doing right now if you weren't here in the woods enjoying this program? Dinner. Having dinner. He said as he advanced up the line, he said on bark fires in rear of these works were well-filled coffee pots with steaming coffee and frying pans with pickled pork. The initial phase of Gordon's flank attack is going wonderfully. The men had hit the end of the Union line without any serious notice. The troops that we talked about that did spot them did not have the time to spread, spend, uh, to spread any of the word. The fighting is going along very quickly, and the Federals are retreating. And last but not least, the commanders, the two brigade commanders here at the end of the line, are at Sedgwick's headquarters on up in that direction when the fighting started. So uh, this area in which we already talked about having no division commander keeping an eye out for this important end of the line. We don't even have brigade commanders here at the moment the attack begins. Wonderful set of circumstances, some planned very carefully by the Confederates, some by sheer dumb luck, but everything is as successful as it could possibly be at this point. And now we'll see how things go as the Confederates progress on down the Union line. As we move, again, we're going to be on a trail, and immediately to your left, as we go on up the hill, you will be able to see these Union earthworks here. Okay. <laughs>